It's Ken Harbaugh on the Midas Touch Network. In our companion series, Against All Enemies, we've been diving deep into the overt religiosity that has become a feature of mainstream Republican politics, culminating in the election of Mike Johnson on a party line vote to become Speaker of the House. Speaker Johnson is a fundamentalist Christian who openly claims to have been chosen by God for his current role. He has described America not as a democracy, but as a biblical republic, and he was one of the prime architects of the big lie that led to the January 6th insurrection. If you think I am exaggerating the degree to which Speaker Johnson declares a divine right to rule, check out the Against All Enemies video in which he says he was selected not by the votes of his peers, but by the Almighty to be America's Moses. I'll put the link to that video in the notes below. Today, we've got Frank Schaefer on the show to discuss how the religious right went so badly off the rails and took the Republican Party with it. Frank was born and raised in a hugely influential conservative Christian family. He has been described as evangelical royalty. I asked my friend Dara Star Tucker to guest host this interview because she is especially familiar with both the evangelical movement and Frank's work. I think you're going to love this one. Thanks. Well, welcome to Burn the Boats, Frank Schaefer. I'm so glad to have you here today. Likewise, Dara. Thank you for being with me. I, I can't tell you how excited I am to talk to you specifically. Um, you don't know me, but I sort of, I guess, by association, I know of you um, quite well. I, I can't say that I've done the deep dive on your work, which is great because I like for conversations like this to feel fresh. Um, and I think there are a lot of places that uh, we're going to have an, an interesting time going today because a lot of my history intersects with your history, um, even in the evangelical world. So um, I will say that uh, Frank Schaefer is an author. How else would you describe yourself, uh, Frank? I don't, I don't want to limit uh, you. Can, you. can you tell the folks um, just in, in general how you, how you think of yourself, how you describe what you do? Sure. Well, let me start by saying that at 71, uh, with three grown children and a grandfather of five kids for whom I do child care, these days, and I'm not trying to be cute, I, I don't really think of myself as either an author or a speaker or a commentator, or all those things I've done for a living. Um, after doing this interview with you, the other important date I have today is 3 p.m. pickup for my nine-year-old granddaughter that I do every day, <laughs> what I will be cooking for her this afternoon and this evening, the child care I'll do for her, um, taking my 15-year-old granddaughter to lunch this weekend, and the fact that my wife, Jeannie, survived a heart attack two years ago and is doing so well and asked me to open a bottle of red wine this morning so she could get a cup of red wine for the French onion soup she's making because she likes to cook too. That's actually who I am. Now, if you're asking me about bio type stuff, I guess I would say that I grew up in a famous evangelical household that the New York Times once described as evangelical royalty. And I left that in the after having become believe it or not, a nepotistic sidekick evangelical leader myself to my father, Francis Schaeffer, in the 1970s and 80s. We made a series of movies that became very famous on the evangelical and conservative Roman Catholic circuit because one series called Whatever Happened to the Human Race was really the foundation of the evangelical anti-abortion movement in the 70s and 80s. And so when I fled that movement, I became persona non grata to those folks. Um, I, I have been a writer, uh, oh, I don't know, for 35, 40 years now, I've written five novels and a whole bunch of nonfiction, including a memoir called Crazy for God, which I guess gets used in a lot of university history courses these days because they feel that perhaps it's a good description of the formation of the religious right and how and why it took over the Republican Party as part of my own family history. So I'm, I'm sort of an odd person. I'm a writer, self-employed type of guy. Uh, I'm a commentator. I have a podcast called In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. And um, I interview a lot of people just like you're interviewing me. I'm uh, actually so much so now that these days, um, you know, I, I used to do a lot of interviews when people like you were interviewing me and I still do media. I, I show up on, on Joy Reid's show from time to time on MSNBC and all that kind of thing. But 
Um, I'm very comfortable interviewing people. Um, I love conversations just like you do. And I probably interview one or two people, one or two authors a week on In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. And they range from everybody from former rock stars like Moby to uh, well-known authors or to just some young person who's doing something interesting um, and all, all points in between. And I guess I'll just wrap by saying that of late, by necessity and not by choice, I've spent a lot of time commenting on what's happened to the Republican Party in becoming part of the Trump cult, for which my family bears some responsibility, not for Trump, but for the direction of the party and its extremism. Um, and I guess uh, besides the child care I'm doing, the other overriding concern I have is to try to undo some of the damage my family did in making the Republican Party more of a far right radical fringe movement that finally turned into the Trump cult. Uh, and, and as I worry about the future for my family and my grandchildren, it provides a motivation to really deal with subjects that are really distasteful to me. I'd much rather just be in the kitchen cooking something with my wife or taking care of the children. At, at 71, you don't have so much to prove. And, uh, but, but we're in, we're in a fix right now. And I guess if you love anybody in this life, you, you try to protect them. And I do my best to undo some of the damage we did. I don't know if that rambling, crazy intro <laughs> helps you or not, but that's the best shot I can do this morning. Well, yeah, it provides, I think, a good base, a good basis for kind of a launching point for this conversation. I will tell you a little bit about myself as it relates to you and to your, your father. I uh, went to a school called Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I'm trying to remember the department head's name for the humanities courses that we were all forced um, to take at ORU, but they heavily emphasized the humanities because of a specific couple that was there that headed up that program, that they were huge admirers of your father. Hmm. And they watched all of his films. They were, I think they were Catholic, probably. Uh, which was a little bit unusual to, you know, to choose a, a Catholic couple to head up a humanities department at an evangelical university like Old Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But they were hugely influential on that program. And so we watched your dad's films for four years. We all had to do four years of the humanities. And it was a notoriously hated program, partly because of these films, I hate to say, uh, Frank, because of these films of your dad's called How Should We Then Live? Um, and they they appealed to me on an intellectual level. I, I appreciated the intellectualism of these films. Mm. Uh, but they were at the point that I went to school in the 90s. They were old and they were crackly. And, you know, he, he dressed sort of funny and quirky and he spoke in very, you know, erudite language. And a lot of people just they hated them, frankly. Um, but they were hugely influential on, I think, the, the thought formation for a lot of people you know, like me that really did plug in and that did care um, and that sought to sort of expand their knowledge. And it was all presented very intellectually um, for some of us who had grown up. I grew up as the child of, uh, of a minister, a music minister. My father was a music minister and a preacher. And he came out of the Holiness Pentecostal Church and he ended up kind of uh, shifting to more of a word of faith, charismatic, uh, Pentecostal evangelical uh, kind of world. So I grew up with one foot in both of those worlds, holiness, Pentecostal, and then the evangelical movement. And so we were very much a part of, um, you know, the, the byproduct or the result of the work that both you and your father um, had done. Hmm. When I was a kid in the eighties when that whole push towards um, political activism within the church was really blossoming. Reagan was in, in office and uh, we were all being encouraged. I, I remember a lot of chatter around, you know, we have to get out there and mobilize and get out of the pew and get into the voting booth. And it was just, it was becoming a whole thing mm -hmm. in large part due to the work of your father. So I kind of want to talk first about the, uh, the, the foundational stuff. I really actually want to start our conversation with... Um, your comments on the uh, the appointing or the election of Mike Johnson mm. to mm. the House of Representatives. And then I kind of want to backtrack and talk about uh, your history and helping to um, kind of establish this movement 
in the U.S. that has basically led to the point where we are now, which is yeah. the the appointing of Mike Johnson as Speaker of the mm. House. Can you talk to me about why uh, why we should be particularly concerned about um, his election specifically? Mm. Well, y- you've got a lot of stuff there. Um... And I was also I, I also have a German degree and lived in Switzerland, by the way, which I think is is at least partly where you grew up. Yeah, I, just I did wanted grow up to, there. Where, where were you in Switzerland? I was in Interlaken. And what were you doing there? I was trying to learn German a little bit better, not realizing that the um, the Schweizerdeutsch that they spoke in Switzerland was not it didn't really have anything to do with high German. Um, but I, I majored in international business and German studies at Oral Roberts University, so I wanted to learn the German language better. So I, I au pair'd there for a year after when, I graduated. When was that? College. If you don't mind this me, asking. early early two thousands, like oh oh three, I think I was there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let me let me backtrack a little, and I will jump into the Mike Johnson. Point here, if I wander, pull me back to it. <laughs> uh, my history with ORU goes back into the day when you know we were there speaking, and I remember being on campus. I knew Richard Roberts, I knew Oral Roberts. I was there in the seventies and the eighties. They brought my dad, I think, twice. Um, the Roberts family were very flaky, and they've had all sorts of criminal indictments since the son and the father who died, but. You know, even back in the day, we kind of them regarded them uh, as as that, uh, and most evangelicals did. And then, then the university sort of became a little more respectable, and had people teaching there who were serious about the academic pursuit. I guess by the time you got there, <clears throat> the Roberts family itself was less of a thing. But back right. in the day, uh, ORU is a real outlier with its prayer tower and or, or, Oral raising money saying that he would die three days later unless he got the money that God had shown him he needed. You know, there were things that um, were odd. Okay, so that's just water under the bridge. But but um, when it gets to, to Mike Johnson, um, there's a connection there personally as well Unfortunately, when it comes to him, I actually know what I'm talking about, and, and I'm not BSing. Uh, I, I mean that because I know the people that formed and shaped him. I know who mm-hmm. he follows. I know Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council and, and Ralph Reed and Franklin Graham. These are three people who discipled and mentored um, him. They, all three of them, are not very closeted, pretty out in the open, Reconstructionist theonomous, following a movement that was started by Rusas Rashtuni in the 60s and 70s, who I also knew well, stayed with for a week one time in California. And the Reconstructionists believed that the Constitution of the United States was a big, bad mistake. They actually agree with a lot of more secular uh, commentators um, when it comes to politics, because they admit that as a document, it was not the founding of a Christian country, but rather the document owes its influence in terms of the rights of individuals, et cetera, et cetera, to the French Enlightenment, and before that, the Italian Renaissance, exactly what they hate most, because that's Mm. where, to use their terminology, secular humanism was born. So when it came to Rashtuni, and when I tell people this, they, they, they don't believe me, but I sat with him and he told me these things personally and then wrote down 23 volumes of a huge magisterial work he did that's unreadable and goes on forever, but in which he argues for the reintroduction of the slavery, the slave trade. You heard that right. He argues for the public execution of gay people, homosexuality being forbidden in the Old Testament. He regards the U.S. Constitution as a bastardized slippage away from the vision of the Bay State Colony and Winthrop and the others who knew what to do with people like the Pequot Indians when they burned them alive. And Rush Dooney's vision would be literally actually aligned with, for instance, right now, as I speak to you today, the West Bank settlers in Israel who feel they have a godly mandate to return to the Old Testament borders of Israel and prosecute uh, a land-stealing and, if necessary, genocidal war against Palestinians. I'm not talking about Gaza and the war there. I'm talking about the West Bank Orthodox Jewish settlers who, uncoincidentally, are supported by Mike Hagee of 
Houston, who's an enormous Pentecostal preacher there, believing in the end times, has a church of thousands, a mega church. His whole shtick is taking tour groups to Israel, waiting for the return of Jesus. He's the one that pushed Trump to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. There's an entire thing there. Um, but is this, is this Rush John Dooney, or is this, pardon? Uh, 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 is this John Hagee or is this, you're speaking of his son? As, no, as this is other. John, this is Hagee, the preacher. I, I may have John gotten, Hage. did I mix the name up? Did I say Mike? I didn't say Mike, I just didn't know. Yeah, 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 that's because taken over. half of my head is trying to get back to your question, Mike. Okay. We're taking a little circuitous path here. But the thing is, what people need to understand about Mike Johnson and why I'm talking at length about Russ Dooney and the Christian Zionist movement, et cetera, et cetera, is that's the wing mm -hmm. of evangelicalism he comes from and was shaped by. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand, the first thing you've got to understand with Mike Johnson is that when the media is shocked by him talking about rescinding gay marriage rights, what they don't understand is that's his toned down public persona that he will allow you to see. What Mike mm -hmm. really believes, because I know Tony Perkins who mentored Mike as his most influential person. Mike also read my dad's books and was influenced by them. Mm -hmm. But what, what Mike believes and what Tony Perkins and these other people believe that in the best of all worlds, we would no longer be a democracy, but a theocracy, period. And, mm -hmm. and, and the media finds this so far-fetched in the same way they found it far-fetched that Trump could beat Hillary Clinton until the minute he did. Right. Okay. Remember what that was like. Yeah. Uh, nobody thought he could win. Um, Nobody takes seriously the idea of the American white nationalist theocracy movement because to them it's so far-fetched. They don't know anybody like that. I grew up with these people and I knew them personally, the leaders that guys like Johnson now follow. So he's really bad news because he's the third in line to the presidency. He's two heartbeats away from sitting in the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. If he was in the Oval Office, we would not only have an enemy of democracy, but we would have an actual proponent of theocracy. Those proponents are already in, in our government. For instance, Amy Coney Barrett, who was groomed and raised and spent her whole life and is still a member of a cult uh, that even is far-fetched for conservative Roman Catholics. She also is a theocrat. And, and these folks think tactically they will take two steps forward, then one step back so they can duck the extremism label. But in the best of all worlds, our country, the United States of America, would fall somewhere between Iran and, and the Roman Catholicism of the 12th century in Europe. And that's where we would be on abortion, women's rights, child rearing, corporal punishment all the way down, by the way, with Rush Juni, believed in beating children and preached it, um, and all the rest of it. So the... The wing of the Republican Party shaped by evangelicals, the Trump cult has various parts to it, and I'm almost done here. One part of it is super extreme. Back in my day, when we were advocating for things, we were never that extreme. My dad did not like Rush Dooney. He said he was non-Christian in his views. Dad believed in democracy, by the way, agree or disagree with his views on abortion. He liked our democratic system and he thought it was part of the fruit of both Christianity and the Enlightenment. He actually admitted and knew his history. Rush Dooney did too, but said we, we need to push for Old Testament law to be resubscribed to. And that is where the extreme wing of the Republican Party is today, not all Republicans. And it just so happens that in my day, we were outsiders looking in, even with our watered down version of this. So people like Ronald Reagan, who we knew, and the, and both Bush presidents, who we knew, and all those folks, and people like Jack Kemp, who was a congressman and then a vice presidential candidate with Bob Dole and so forth, whose home I used to stay in, none of them bought into any of this. But they regarded us as necessary idiots to pander to with abortion and all the rest of it to get our vote. Fast forward to today, and this really is the end of my little speech here, Johnson is not just as extreme as we were. He's far more extreme and was groomed by people far more extreme than my father. But, and here's the big kicker, he's not an outside agitator looking in. He's an absolute sincere believer, unlike Trump who believes nothing except in his own power. Johnson's an absolute sincere believer, now totally on the inside. 
with views that are far more extreme than the agitators of the religious right that we were part of. So we've come completely full circle. And, and now what we've got is really something. And I don't think so far I've read nothing from people in the popular media who seem to get what this theology is about and have done any legwork at all to find out who, who, his influence, uh, who has influenced him. I happen to know. So it's not um, pleasant knowledge, but it's real and I'm not making it up. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, you know, I do a series of videos that I call the breakdown on my socials on my social media. That's kind of what I've, I'm a singer by trade, but I've sort of shifted into a bit of online activism. And so this has kind of been a whole other world that has opened up to me. And I feel like I speak from a very specific and unique point of view as being, first of all, a black woman and someone who's raised in the evangelical world and someone who has sort of deconstructed, which is the new terminology that we're using. And um, back in, as you say, my day, it was called just being rebellious. My, my grandmother was a Pentecostal pastor. And so for me to shift and move away from, you know, a lot of these, this traditional thinking, fundamentalist thinking, um, in my sect is, is seen as a very controversial mm -hmm. thing, but I feel like it gives me a very specific point of view to be able to step back and get a bird's eye view and, and evaluate and analyze some of this stuff, um, as a former insider, um, and so that it, it just has exposed me to a lot that I feel um, allows me to avoid the maybe dismissive way that a lot of people discuss um, Christian nationalism. Mm. Um, mm. I wasn't necessarily at the heart of the, the white Christian nationalism part of it. Um, I feel like with Oral Roberts University specifically, there was a difference in the way that 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 he, that, that university developed versus uh, Liberty University, which is was Jerry Falwell's university. And I do want to talk to you about Paul Weirich and Jerry Falwell and um, C. Everett Koop and some of the other kind of founding fathers of this, this um, modern day nationalist movement, Christian nationalist movement. But the way that Oral Roberts University developed versus uh, Jerry Falwell's Liberty University, which I think is that Virginia where Liberty is? Yes. Um, that started out as a segregationist university, Liberty University did, versus um, Oral Roberts University, which, uh, you know, I feel my understanding of how that that uh, school developed. It was with, with much more of a focus on integration and um, just the mindset was completely, I don't want to say completely different, but there were a lot of differences in the mindset. Jerry Falwell, when I really started to study some of the history of what began as Lynchburg Baptist College and what is now Liberty University. I've done videos on this, like I said, in these breakdowns that I do, little mini documentaries on TikTok and on Instagram and have tried to help people to understand, you know, more of the foundation of where all of this comes from. Uh, but Liberty University began as a segregationist college and not a lot of people understand that. And I kind of, I recoil, I was talking to a friend of mine that I went to ORU with uh, just yesterday or a couple days ago. And she was talking about sending her her child to Liberty University. And I just inside, I just I started to clench up because I'm like, man, we don't know. We don't understand. We don't know what the real history is mm -hmm. there. Um, so I would like for you to kind of explain briefly, if you could, the relationship between your father, Francis Schaefer, and people like C. Everett Koop, uh, Jerry Falwell, Paul Weirich, who really were at the heart. They were at the the foundation of the modern, of the contemporary um, evangelical you know, nationalist movement or in, uh, the, the push towards involving Christians more in the political process because that wasn't happening. Um, I've done a video about how a lot of a lot of the foundation of this started even with um, these segregationist schools like Lynchburg College, Liberty University, and that um, the requirement with Brown versus Board of Education that these schools integrate. And that was a huge mobilizing factor. But kind of talk to me if you can. I know this is a very, it's a, just a broad subject, but if you can give me kind of a just a, a nutshell version of, of, of the relationship between these men in the 60s and 70s, I guess it would well, be. Well, you know, I, it, it, it's going to seem weird to keep saying I knew these guys personally, but, you know, I, I did. Um, and you keep going back to a past era that I was part of uh, as the young nepotistic sidekick of a famous evangelical leader and intellectual. Uh, and, you know, I was tagging along. I wrote and directed the movies that you were talking about, both How Should We Then Live, which I produced and directed uh, many of the episodes of. And then I wrote and directed the entirety of Whatever Happened to the Human Race with Sierra Coop. Uh, 
based on their book. And as such, I was part of the traveling circus that went out on seminar tours around the country and filled stadiums with the first series. And the second series on abortion actually was a financial dis disaster at the beginning because, and this is something I you may or may not know about, but our fight was not with the National Organization of Women and, and NARAL and other pro-choice groups. It was with the evangelicals who were pro-choice, starting with Reverend Billy Graham, the famous evangelist, and with Dr. Criswell, who was president of the Southern Baptist Convention that doesn't get any more right-wing white and Southern Baptist than that, and also president of, of Dallas Baptist Theological Seminary. These guys were pro-choice, pro-choice, not ambivalent on abortion. They thought it should be legal. Nobody, mm. in th today's discussion, you don't hear that. You would think that abortion was like contraceptives have always been to the Roman Catholics forever, that it was sort of part of the fabric of evangelical teaching. It was not. Mm. So in 1976 or 77, when we brought the second series out on abortion, whatever happened to the human race, we were playing to empty stadiums where four years before with How Should We Then Live, we sold out the Grand Old Opry. We sold out uh, Madison Square Garden. We sold out Dallas Convention Center. Sold out, literally, every seat taken. And dad hadn't fallen away in popularity. We showed up with a movie on abortion. It's like, what's that got to do with us? And, mm -hmm. and we had to fight an entire battle, for instance, with the editors of Christianity Today magazine who refused to endorse it with Billy Graham, whom dad and I sat down with three times at the Mayo Clinic where he was getting some treatment at the time, begging him to jump on board. These were all people who had lined up behind the first series, the one you didn't like uh, <laughs> in college. No, I liked it. You're not getting your money back, okay? Um, <laughs> I loved it, actually. <laughs> yeah. All right. But anyway, what I'm saying is that the first little footnote I want to share with you as a fly on the wall who was actually there. So this isn't theory because I actually sat in Billy's hospital room at the Methodist hospital in the Mayo Clinic saying, Billy, why don't you, you know, and, and the best we could get is his wife, Ruth, helped found a crisis pregnancy center three years later, sort of joined our team, so to speak. But these are family friends that went back years. Like Franklin, I met Franklin first when we were both nine years old. I, we knew the Grahams. Gigi Graham still takes me to breakfast anytime I'm in town near the Billy Graham Center where she works. She's an old friend of mine. We're both in our seven. Well, she's pushing 80 now. You know, the, these are all real connections. So I, I, I was there. All right. In that context, Paul Wyrick came along, met with me in Washington, D.C. and with Dad, and he was into direct mail, raising money for right wing activists. He knew Jerry Falwell. He was a radical Roman Catholic and actually part sort of like Amy Coney Barrett of a side of a, a cult that was rebelling against Vatican, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the Vatican where they went from Latin mass to in English, all those changes that, that happened, um, coming out of the Vatican. And he, wa he wanted it all back in Latin. And, you know, this, this guy, you know, for him, the best part of history was in the 12th century and it was downhill ever after. He was very political, very anti-abortion, um, and he saw Jerry Falwell floundering around, having had his school integrated, as you rightly pointed out, forced to integrate. Jerry was looking for a new issue, because how do you keep stoking the rage machine when you've lost a big battle on race? And and he knew that it wouldn't fly anymore, so he set his sights on two things. The uh, what he called the homosexual conspiracy, which was the rising, uh, pow not power so much, but the visibility of the gay rights movement, and women, feminism, women should stay in the home, women shouldn't work. And as a part of that traditionalism, of course, the abortion issue came along. And at first, Jerry, like everybody else uh, that I'd been talking to, it's like, well, this is a Catholic thing, isn't it? And you got to understand when I grew up, Catholics weren't saved. They weren't real Christians. Only we were real Christians, mm -hmm. blood bought, Bible believing evangelicals. We were the true church. Catholics weren't even saved. So it mm -hmm. wasn't just a Catholic issue. It was an issue with people that we didn't even regard as fellow travelers. They, they might as well have been Hindus as far as we were concerned. When I say was a child, uh, my parents shifted later out of, I guess, some growth, but also political expediency. Well, anyway, Wyrick went to Jerry Falwell. So I knew Jerry um, 
when we were flying around the country for the seminar tour, he lent us his jet. And so we would fly around the country in his jet. And then I spoke at Liberty University twice um, wow. to the whole student body. And then once from the pulpit of the church um, and came away from that experience, even in my right wing phase, despising Falwell because hmm. he was one of the meanest people I've ever met. And his wow. sons and he were just straight out con artists, thieves. They were designing hmm. vast, clever fundraising programs. I'll just give you one example, getting obituary notices about all their donors, widows, uh, collecting them and writing a quote, personal letter, just happening to mention that your husband or your wife, fill in the blank, had promised a major donation before their death. And I know that Harry would love to be remembered that way. Um, so much so that my friend Cal Thomas, who was then president of the moral majority, quit working with Jerry Falwell because of his disagreement with these sleazy tactics. So this family, in addition to being segregationists, follows genuinely the scum of the earth because I don't know what he actually believed in his heart but I remember just before I went on to speak at his from his pulpit in Liberty Baptist Church that we were in his study and he had been talking about um, how much money he was raising because someone had cut the guy wires on one of their transmission towers and he was saying the homosexuals did it. And he said, oh, so far we've raised three times the cost of the tower because as soon as you throw out that word and he used the F word to describe them, yeah. All my people donate. And then literally, as I was stepping out of the door of his little office behind the pulpit, not his big swanky office, just the little cubbyhole where you change. Actually, on the way to his pulpit, he looked at me and he said, and you know, you know what I think. And I said, well, what do you think? He says, well, if I had a dog that did what those F words do, I'd shoot it. And that was the last thing he said to me as he as I transitioned to the pulpit to speak, and he introduced me with this big, happy, I love everybody grin, and turned on a totally different kind of charm. So 30 seconds before I could have been talking, literally talking to a Nazi in Germany in 1938. And 10 seconds later, he's introducing the son of Francis Schaeffer, who will be our speaker today, with his smarmy, sorry for the English here, but for, with his smarmy shit-eating grin. And that was him. Falwell wasn't that, uh, uh, you know, so Fal people often ask me about some of these leaders I knew. Um, were they flakes? Are they thieves? Did they believe anything? And all I can tell you with Jerry Jr., who's a thief, as well as a philanderer, a hypocrite, the apple did not fall far from the tree. And that is this whole pool boy thing, whatever. The Falwell family is a disaster. And Liberty University is, is a disaster because of that. All kinds of stuff from contemporary students about the way sexual assault reports get buried, the way they are bullied into not reporting malfeasance on the school, the amount of money that has gone into the Falwell family from so-called a nonprofit 5013C university education group, the way they have done real estate deals with properties adjoining so that they can personally profit. You know, th this is one of the sleaziest families that I've ever run up against in any walk of life. And I worked in Hollywood as a director and I know all kinds of people, but there is nobody worse than the Falwell clan. Oral Roberts, not that way. Oral Roberts was just a good old Pentecostal preacher. I think he believed every single word he said. He also was very canny when it came to fundraising, very flaky from the point of view of whatever. But, you know, there wasn't a mean bone in his body. I'm just talking about my own impressions of people I knew. When it comes to Paul Weirich, he was just an operator and he didn't particularly care for any of these people. He was a radical, old fashioned Roman Catholic who reviewed, who viewed these Protestants as heretics, necessary evil to work with to bring about his sort of um, version of a, a kind of a reconstructionist version of Catholicism where, you know, he was going to move the country in the right direction, get us on abortion and all the rest so that he could get Republicans elected. And when he, you know, he wanted to move the whole country to the far right. So he used these guys. So basically, you know, we, we were hanging around with people back in the day who just who, who, who were, you know, a very mixed bag of people. But the result was that 
Falwell in the end decided that there was money to be made in the energy of the pro-life movement once we got it going. And then he, he saw fundraising opportunities in stirring the pot again and again of, of the kind of anger machine. He send me 25 bucks and I can you know, push these secular humanists back and the liberals and the Democrats. They just repeated it, repeated it, repeated it. They would throw all kinds of issues up against the wall. And if something stuck, then they would latch on. And abortion would not have worked for them without our film series, which they then capitalized on. And once it started becoming a thing, they got in on the act. Before that, you never heard a word about abortion from Falwell or any of these guys. It was all segregation and and uh, things like that. When that didn't work, they looked for other things. And then they focused on two things, gay rights and women's rights. And as part of fighting back against women's rights, they took a, quote, stand on abortion. You know, w- once they were able to figure out that they could raise money that way and they, you know, they're they're their inheritors of the movement are still doing it today. And of course, in the end, that's why Roe got reversed and all the rest. And Jerry, and uh, Jerry's final legacy, I guess you could say, is the Trump presidency. Thanks for watching, everyone. I am trying something new, a Patreon page. It's a way you can support the show and make sure we can keep bringing you this content. My hope is that we can continue to limit the amount of ads we run here and that we can also build a community around this effort to fight back against extremists and their enablers. Subscribers to the Patreon page will have access to exclusive and ad-free content and also early releases. Please consider helping us out. Go to patreon.com slash Ken Harbaugh or click on the link below. We're just getting started with this, so your support early on will make a huge difference in building real momentum. Thanks so much for helping out. Sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health. When you are sleeping well, you can perform at your best mentally and physically. Proper sleep can also increase focus, boost energy, and improve your mood. Introducing Beam's Dream Powder, a science-backed healthy hot cocoa for sleep. Today, our listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder, their science-backed healthy hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. Now available in delicious flavors like chocolate peanut butter, cinnamon cocoa, and sea salt caramel with only 15 calories and zero grams of sugar. Better sleep has never tasted better. Other sleep aids can cause a next day grogginess, but Dream contains a powerful all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, and melatonin to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. The numbers don't lie in a clinical study 93% of participants reported Dream helped them get better sleep. Beam Dream is easy to add to your nighttime routine. Just mix Dream into hot water or milk, froth, and enjoy before bed. Find out why Forbes and the New York Times are all talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes and business professionals. If you want to try Beam's best-selling Dream Powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash boats and use code boats at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash boats for 40% off at checkout. Hi, Burn the Boats fans. I want to take a quick break to talk about our sponsor for today's show, Roan. Men's closets are long overdue for a radical reinvention, and Roan has stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection represents the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible clothes I've ever found. Roan makes it so easy to get ready for any occasion. The commuter collection offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, quarter zips, and polos. Roan's comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy whatever life throws your way, from your commute to work to weekends at the kids' ball games. Looking good is easy with Roan's wrinkle release technology, which makes wrinkles magically disappear, seriously, as you wear the products. It's really that easy. I don't have time between work and family and everything in between to worry about dry cleaning or ironing with Roan. I don't have to. I just wear and go. And I feel great doing it. Even after a long day, Roan feels clean and new and just as comfortable as the moment I put it on. You got to try it out. Head to roan.com slash boats and use promo code boats to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to R-H-O-N-E dot com slash boats and use code boats. 
Trust me, Roan makes choosing what to wear not just easy, but classy and comfortable. That's roan.com slash boats. So I guess why do you, in, in the work that I do, as I said, I do these kind of little mini explainers, little mini docs and storytelling online around um, a lot of this, around a lot of topics, but this is one of my my topics that I that I like to talk about. And I've started a series called Toxic Conservatism, just kind of getting into some of the, the history and the, the why, the foundational kind of elements of, as to why we have ended up in the place that we've ended up. Um, and one of my, my passions, as I said, is to have these conversations with other conservatives and to not, not sort of leave them out of the conversation. Like, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna camp up over here. We're gonna silo ourselves. And aren't those people so crazy? It is a passion of mine to, to sort of pull them into the conversation because I think that that absolutely needs to happen. And one of, in one of the videos I did recently, um, I talked about how, how they have played the long game. They've been playing this game for, as you said, this has been groundwork that's laid for 50 years to take down mm -hmm. Roe versus Wade. And that's not their only goal. And so some of the difficulty that I have in, in having these conversations with my family, many of whom are still very, uh, very uh, religiously and politically conservative and friends and people I went to school with, like I said, at ORU, um, it's a difficult thing sometimes to have conversations with other conservatives um, or people that I, you know, that, that um, were, were my world for most of my life. It's difficult to have conversations with them about the dangers of this movement because ideologically and morally, they line up with a lot of what's going on right now. So it's difficult to help them to understand the danger of the, the, the political element or the political thrust of this movement. So can you kind of, from your point of view, um, do you attempt to have those conversations with conservatives or is it your point of view that, hey, we've just, we've got to know kind of where we stand and let them come to us if they're willing or able to do that? Or do you, is that reach out element and an important part of the work that you do? And there's no wrong answer here. I just, I kind of want to understand from your point of view, um, are you, are you evangelical, I guess, in your, your, um, your, your discussions around this? I, the answer to that is yes and no. Yes. In the sense that, for instance, um, I visit back in Switzerland when I return the ministry I am friends with the people who are there now. I've stayed there and talked with them. Uh, some of my family is still involved in that ministry. And I what, um, what, what part of Switzerland? Uh, it's in the French speaking part of Switzerland near Montreux Lausanne. If you know where the Montreux Jazz Festival is, it's 20 minutes from there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Down by Lake yeah, yeah. Geneva. Uh, okay. It's not actually on the lake, it's up in the mountains, but you know, 20 minute drive away. Um, okay. So it's this, this, the French speaking part of Switzerland, very near the Italian border down there by the lake. So mm. that's where I grew up. So I go back and I talk with them. Uh, when it comes to evangelical type media or things like that, obviously I was, a, you know, like my dad back in the day when I was publishing and so forth, I was well known in those circles. I never hear from any of those people because I've just sort of died to them. Um, mm -hmm. But with my podcast, my producer, Ernie Gregg, and I have been reaching out to, um, you know, what I'll call reasonable conservative authors and others who I would have fundamental disagreements with, but they're not Trumpists um, and they're not particularly evangelical. And um, I have been interviewing a number of them and we're actually booking a couple more. So when you look at my podcast, it's not left wing liberals all the way down. Um, there are some thoughtful uh, writer, commentator type people um, from the right, from what you might call the the sane right. For instance, the head of the history department from Notre Dame University. I interviewed him. We had a wonderful discussion, um, and he's written a book looking at you know all sorts of areas that I agree with some, disagree with some. But we've had a real discussion, and they've been, you know, and I've asked him to offer me some other names of people I can talk to. So yes, yes, I am making an effort to use whatever platform I have to talk to people um, and to discuss with, with them and not attack them. But just, okay, you've written a book. Let's talk about it. I do the same on the left, by the way. I have I have all kinds of interviews with people on the left who are, for, I, I, to say further left than me is not a good description, but to say um, 
take views, a kind of an absolutism and certainty about certain things on social issues. I'm not talking about abortion. I'm hardly pro-choice, but, uh, you know, so, so I'll talk to people to the left of me, to the right of me, all points in between. I make every effort to do so when it comes to my, my own, uh, podcast, personal relationships. I've done what I can to maintain folks who are still in the ministry that my parents founded Labrie Fellowship to the extent it's possible. Um, when it comes to the evangelical community in general, I would never be invited to speak and none of them would ever appear on anything with me because that would blacklist them. You know, that there, there goes their next invitation to speak at Wheaton College. Hey, he was on Frank Schaefer's podcast. Forget it. It would be kind of a, a, a strike against them. So, you know, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's kind of where I'm at on it. Well, I guess just in theory, what, what, how would you talk to someone? I'll ask it in that way. How would you speak to someone about the dangers of the Christian nationalist movement? Someone who is Christian or someone who does consider themselves to be evangelical. How would you have that conversation with them about the dangers of the, the you know, a Mike Johnson or a Marjorie Taylor Greene or the many other figures now that are populating our political landscape? Why are these people uh, folks that we should be wary of, that we should look out for, that we should be concerned about. I mean, isn't this just a wonderful thing if these people are representing our morality uh, on the political stage? Isn't this just a great thing? Why is this something to be concerned about? You know, I don't know. I don't have a, a magic formula here, but I would just say, I think on a personal level, I would start talking about some of the hypocrisy of just the the way the whole movement operates, the money, the greed, the the power hunger in it, in it, how far away from anything that could be called basically Christ-like, I would really get into the weeds on that. In other words, whether I buy into those beliefs anymore myself, which is a different discussion, and I'm happy to go there if you want to in this interview, that's a different topic. Mm -hmm. But I but I grew up in it, and I know the language, and I also know what, for instance, my parents believed. And I might tell them a little bit of my own story. They might say, well, you, you left the movement. Were you bitter against your parents? You know, they're always making up these reasons that would fit their idea. I'd say, no, it's actually quite the reverse. Before my father got famous as an evangelical writer, it was a very humble little ministry. Dad worked on the, a tray on the corner of his bed in a rocking chair. He didn't have a desk. He didn't have a secretary. We didn't have a car. The only meat we ever got was on the weekends. Mother would make roast chicken for Sunday with rice and gravy. And that's, we shared that with the students who were staying with us. And the thing that began my journey out of the movement you're still part of, speaking to you as if you were in one of these people, you mm -hmm. know, what you've heard of, you know, that I'm angry or bitter, it's all lies. I mean, actually read my books, you'll see they're not angry and bitter. Uh, mm -hmm. My secular editors think they're very loving and nice portraits of, of a, something I left and interesting. But if you really want to know what began my journey out of your movement, it was comparing the humility, the kindness, and the lack of greed, the Christ-like behavior of my mom and dad and how they treated people in our ministry and why people became Christians in that ministry. It was because they actually were trying to follow Christ. And my mm -hmm. own journey out of the movement is as I got well-known and my father got well-known and I began to meet the leaders of what then mutated into the religious right, the flakes, the thieves, the meanness, the, the bitterness, the personality cults, everything that became Trumpism in the end was already there. And the reason Trump was able to mislead so many people is he was actually so much like their own leaders. It was all about the mm -hmm. money. It was all about wow. the power. They were all hypocrites. That's why I got out of the movement. It was the opposite of what you think. I left because I had grown up seeing what genuine Christ-like kindness was like. I remember my mom down on her hands and knees in the kitchen, mopping up the vomit from a heroin addict that my parents had taken mm -hmm. in, didn't throw her out. She was a young British musician who was on heroin. She would go into the woods and shoot up. She vomited in our kitchen. And my mother cleaned the vomit up and sat her down and made her a cup of tea. Did they kick her out? No because my parents believed that they were reaching out to lost people, not just in a theological sense, but that really that's how you treat people. 
And the same with the gay couples who came to Labrie. This is in the 50s and 60s. Integration, my father opened Labrie up in 1966 to 60 students from Sofia University in Bulgaria, all of whom were African students from Nigeria and all these places on communist scholarships. They could come to Switzerland because it was a neutral country. It was the only country in Europe they could visit because it was not in NATO while they were in a communist East Bloc school. And dad had them all come for the summer. This is in the, the mid to late 60s. And that's who was there that summer was all these African students. My father performed um, a quote, interracial marriage with one of them and a young English woman that they had met preached a sermon saying that unlike people in America, evangelicals, he knew that he had left in 1947. He believed in interracial marriage. And by the way, if one of my daughters falls in love with one of our African students, I would be delighted to have her marry a black man. This is in the mid 60s. That was my father. And then as I began to tour around and met people like Jerry Falwell, it's as if I had fallen into a vortex of another planet. My leaving the evangelical movement was in disgust, not with the politics, but with the unchristlike behavior that I witnessed on a leadership level across the nation. I didn't run into people like my parents. I did meet some individual, humble, kind people. But the leadership was in the money, the power, and they were liars. And my parents were truthful and kind people. Now you can disagree with where they went on abortion. You can disagree on where we, the people that we worked with and say, well, why would you work with people like that? Dad regarded them as kind of necessary evil, people like Jerry Falwell, because you know we're trying to spread our message. Okay, that's a different question. But why did Frank Schaefer begin asking a series of questions that eventually let him out of the movement? because I had seen the real thing. And what we were now part of was a lie. And that's how I started out. So what I would tell you is, have you ever stopped back to think how far the movement you're still part of, speaking to you as if you were one of these people, the movement you're still part of has traveled from what your own ideals used to be? Can you remember what it was like to be really in love with Jesus? Can you remember what it was like to really get up every day trying to treat other people as your neighbor? And if you can, do you think your movement is there now? Think about it. That's my, maybe where I would start. And it wouldn't be in a big public speech, just one-on-one. -on -one. That's where I'd begin. I understand the frustrations. I understand how annoying the secular left has become. Believe me, I've had it with the, the virtue signaling, all the gender correctness and language. I have no idea where all this comes from. I'm tired of it. It looks Orwellian to me too. There's a lot I can agree with you on in terms of the extremes on the left, but let's just start with who Jesus was and where your ideals were, say, as a child with your parents who were ministers or whatever it might be. Do you really think this is what is represented now? by the Republican Party that you, you're now part of. I don't. So I don't hold up the left and the Democrats as the kind of paradigm of virtue. I think the virtue signaling, the greenwashing, all the rest of it is all real. I'm sick and tired of all the messing around with the English language to, to virtue signal. I think the left is totally hypocritical on a lot of things. I'm willing to go there in the discussions. But I think the real place to start is the degradation of the ideals that so many evangelicals grew up with. And now what are you settling for? AR-15s, guns all the way down, armed resistance of the US government, no funding for social programs, family values, what family values? Where, where's, the, where's the year of parental leave for every child born? Where's the help that young mothers get? Where's the practical love that my parents showed people in Labrie when they opened their home to mother, young women who came pregnant who had been thrown out of their homes by evangelical pastors. And my mom said, you can come stay with us. That's what ministry looked like to me. And when I began to hit the big time in America, my eyes opened and it was like, this is rotten to the core. And by the way, it's also ruining my marriage because basically I'm being groomed to be an asshole by divine right. 
another power hungry jerk on the fringe of this thing, bossing his wife around, over disciplining his children, coming home angry off the road. And my own journey as a human being was so opposite of everything that I grew up believing in with my parents that I had to look at myself very, very hard. That's why I got out of the movement. And then, of course, you start asking questions. <clears throat> the whole thing eventually unravels. That's a different discussion. So those are some of the places that I talk individually with people. And once in a while, you meet someone who listens. A lot of the time, the evangelical right wing is so hardened now that it's literally like trying to talk somebody in Germany out of being in the Nazi party in 1940. The, the bridge has been crossed and then burned. It's kind of over. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to individuals, you can still try. Well, what I guess in the kind of closing minutes of this, this talk, what do you feel, I guess, are, are the, the strategies that the, um, the rest of us, I don't even necessarily want to say the left, but, the, but those of us who are, are, not, are not willing to go along with this, this agenda, what are the strategies that we can engage in? I mean, one of the things that I've, I've discovered in the research that I've done for uh, the explainer videos and things that I do is, is, is how well-funded this, this, um, the, the right yeah. is that whole movement is, they are so well organized and so well funded. And, you know, so many of these political action committee committees and think tanks and the, you know, the heritage foundation, we could go on and on and on now moms for Liberty and all of these groups who are just there yeah. organizing. I like to say like little worker bees below the surface. And just when you see Roe v. Wade come down that, that, that wasn't something that was just planned for a year or two. This is something that has been in development for, for decades. They're playing the long game. Yeah. And I have never felt like the left or progressives have been nearly as well, uh, has, have been nearly as knowledgeable about what is going on uh, on the right as they should be, or have been nearly as, as organized or, or well-funded. And maybe that's just my, my perception. Maybe that's my overestimating the power of, of this, this other side, because I've been so connected to it or aware of it for so long. But what can progressives, what can the left do to make sure that they are sort of preemptively kind of getting ahead of some of the stuff rather than always reacting to it? You know, I, I am, this is unlike the other topic where I was there and I can tell you exactly what I think. This is just, you know, me, private citizen, uh, casting about for ideas. But one thing I would say is the, the left does a miserable job of prioritizing. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we keep serving our head on a platter to the opposition. You're totally right about the organizational function of the right and the long-term 50-year program. It's not a conspiracy. It's just a plan that worked. And the funding mm -hmm. there from people like the Koch brothers and others. And now, new little wrinkle, as some of these libertarian tech bros throw their money into the fray, like Elon yeah. Musk, for instance, who now describes yeah. himself as a Republican, and who knows how much he's going to throw into the, the fight coming up in the next election to put Donald Trump back in the White House. You know, there's a new there's a new kid in town, and these these billionaires don't have any limit on spending. They're going to make the old funding of the the right wing look like you know the Koch brothers look like a Sunday school picnic, because you know these are people who can take forty four billion dollars and drop it into a vanity project like buying Twitter for the hell of it, and then decide that uh, Republicans are li more favorable toward libertarians who don't want to be regulated by any aspect of the U.S. government at all, and throw their money into it because corporate America actually has more power than the government now. And these guys know that because they're part of that structure. So that's a new thing. But other than that, I think you're totally right in terms of the long-term funding. And I think the only thing that the left can do to counter this is to be a lot smarter when it comes to prioritizing what we want to be talking about. And right now, me personally, all I want to be talking about is that there's only one issue that should bother or mean anything to anybody right now who I think is sane or patriotic. Just throw the net wide. And that is we cannot have a Trump second term or we will move from a democracy to an authoritarian system from which back there, there will not be a way back. And so this is like, you know, want to talk about the environment? Forget it. The environmental movement is dead if Trump becomes president. Want to talk about gay rights or trans rights? Forget it. 
pronouns is not the issue. I, to, to even spend 10 seconds on trying to correct people in terms of pronouns right now is ridiculous. The house is burning down. We're, we're facing cataclysm. So I guess right now, between now and the election day coming up in 2024, my message to anybody who's not a Trumpist, right-wing, MAGA, loving cultist, in other words, anybody but that, whether they're Republican or Democrat or left-wing or black or white or lesbian or gay or trans or heterosexual or a grandfather or a young parent or a high school student is only one thing. Forget everything except the next election and don't do anything to distract from that fight because this is the only thing that matters right now. Why? Because nothing else you care about will be the same the day after if Trump's back in the White House. And you will have lost every battle you're spending your time worrying about now, say trans rights or other gender issues or the future of gay marriage, all of which I believe in, by the way. Race relations, forget it. Defund or fund the police, not an issue. Nothing, nothing matters if we lose this fight. So is that alarmist? Yeah, you're damn straight it's alarmist because this is the time to sound the alarm. I'm 71, I've been in this a long time and there's never, never, ever in my lifetime been anything approach the crisis we face if Trump goes in for a second term because he will be vengeful, he will not be running for a third term. You know, it might be president for life for all we know at that point. Um, his supporters are armed, they are angry, they are misinformed, they are conspiracists. And everything from vaccine availability on another pandemic all the way down to, to school shootings, to race relations, to gay rights, none of this is going to matter if we walk in, blindly walk in to another Trump term. And then if you added majorities in both houses to that, if it was a sweep, and a Supreme Court position to back every single thing he does, a six person far right Catholic slash Protestant cultist majority, we have a prescription that means nothing else you're thinking about, I'm talking not to you now, Dara, but everybody, nothing you think matters, matters if we lose this one. So basically, I'm the oncologist saying, you know, you came in for a checkup on a sore throat and you don't have a dentist right now and you've got us, you need knee surgery and all this other shit. And yes, these are all real problems, but guess what? You have throat cancer. And if we don't start chemo today and radiation therapy and throw everything we've got at it, none of your other ailments matter because you're going to be dead in a month. And that's the situation we're in. So my, to my friends on the left, I am begging, I am pleading, fight this fight. And when it's done, we can all get back to everything that bothers us that we want to correct. But right now, this minute, right now, as we face the future with Trump as potentially the president again, Stop whining about Biden being too old, you idiots. He's done a good job. And if he is the candidate, goddamn, get behind him and fight tooth and nail and stop worrying about whether, you know, he, he, we can, he, he can, if that's what's going to happen, throw your weight behind him. If you take a different view than he does on his leadership with the Palestinian Israeli conflict, sorry, folks, none of that matters if Trump's president. We're going to have somebody who is a, you know, an absolute authoritarian oligarch in power forever and the people who follow him. And look what's already happening with Mike Johnson, et cetera. So if you care about that, <clears throat> get the hell out of the street because this is a distraction. If you're turning part of the left against the Democrats based on this and you'd rather have Trump, you're an idiot because you think you have problems now. Uh, you know, Netanyahu's best friend was Donald Trump. Open season. Told him he, we're going to move the embassy and then after that, take the whole West Bank. Screw the Palestinians. Nothing you care about is going to get better or matters if Biden loses the next election. And, and, and I don't know how many say ways, but sideways to say this, but if I, you know, when I look at the situation, 
if we don't fight for this, we will lose everything. And so I would just say, hey, that's the theme. Till 2024, shut up about everything else and fight the big fight because in context, nothing else will matter. We don't have time for anything else right now. We're, this is an emergency. Well, I guess that, that says it, Frank. That, that could not be any more Frank. And I think a lot of people agree with you at this, this time and place. It's, it's just interesting that we seem to find ourselves in this place of nothing else matters more and more often, that everything is at stake, that this is the most important election of our lifetime. And it starts to sound like hyperbole after a point. But uh, I, I don't think you're wrong. And so as many of us can be sounding the, the clarion call as possible, I think um, the more folks, I think we'll, we'll really understand what is at stake uh, when it comes down to it. Um, thank you, Frank, for, for your um, thoughtful discussion. And like I said, I, there are just so many connection points at which I, I can connect with what you're doing and uh, identify with your story and your journey, your your uh, progression out of that world that you you have come from. So um, I just appreciate the work you do, and I am really honored to have had this conversation with you. I, I really am. Sarah, thank you. You're, you. It's been lovely talking with you. Next time, I'll get to ask the questions. Thanks so much for watching. We're only a few subscribers short of 2 million subs. Please subscribe right now to the Midas Touch YouTube channel for free and help us grow this unapologetically pro-democracy network.